and also um, hopefully we can have a debate in a comradely fashion. Um, anybody want to jump on first? There was a thing on uh, Radio Ulster during the week there where a girl has uh, looking for citizenship for her husband, but first she has to renounce her Britishness and her holding an Irish passport. Like, so how can we? You know what I mean? It's ridiculous. I'll, I'll take a couple of questions in the one go, maybe, and the panelists can, can respond. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Michael didn't get the question because it is a bit loud, if, if, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Sorry. 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 Uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, just, just during the week there, she, she was trying to get citizenship for her husband, who's an American, said that who she's married this last 15, 20 years. But first, she, has, she holds an Irish passport, but she first must, she's been told because she's been born in Northern Ireland that she's British, and she has to renounce her British uh, before she can get, get um, uh, acceptable in the citizenship here in Ireland. So where do we right. stand? Are we, are we British or are we Irish? That's basically the question there. Some bureaucrat in Stormont or wherever it is uh, thinks that we're British, even though we hold Irish passports. Thank you, Brent. Um, anyone else? Right. <coughs> sorry, to, to you, Dave. Apologies for a late arrival. I'm not that down to the dairy. Dublin will not be not really to that down to the dairy. The competence on the part of those who are supposed to upgrade it. I would say that the, the partner road is the road from. The road from. Uh, the road from. To, to Larne, it has long since been done, and any money that's left over has now been spent towards Cone Rain. Um, please. Brian. Uh, you read out a list of the Ireland that you envisage, um, and it actually ties in with the, uh, the first guy's question, uh, an Ireland for this and an Ireland for that. Um, why does this Ireland that New Sinn Féin envisage now have to in, in, in entail an Ireland of two nations? Uh, why does it have to be two nations? And uh, Also, you said that the Irish government were the co guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement. They have absolutely no role in the British border poll. The only person who has a role in the British border poll, and it's in legislation, is the British Secretary of State. And that person only calls a British border poll when, in their opinion, in the opinion of one individual, right, that a majority of the people voting in the six counties would vote for Irish unity. And then they set out, you talk about, I'm not, it's, I'm not, it's to everybody on the panel, right? Then you talk about, they talk about the role of the Irish diaspora. The Irish diaspora has no role in the British border poll. Because the British, unlike in Scotland, where the Scottish Parliament set the question and set the date on a very historic date, the 1st of September uh, 2014, and set the question in the affirmative, in other words, yes for unity. The British Secretary of State will set the questions. The question, or questions, will set who votes. For instance, do 16-year-olds get a vote, or do they not? And then they go on to say that they will include, perhaps, the creation of future criminal offences. Why would they create criminal offences if they're going to be voted out of this place? And even on the other side of a British border poll, a successful one, it says that it will give effect. And that is precisely what Tommy, I understand, is referring to when we talk about dominion status and when new Sinn Féin proxies have recently begun to promote the idea of a Hong Kong solution is you can have unity, but you'll have it in 75 years. Uh, I just want to first of all uh, commend all these for coming together tonight. I definitely think that is the way things need to go. It hasn't been needed for a long time, but you know, hopefully now a bit of inspiration from the Catalonians, that's what we can do. And even get the SDLP on board as well. It can't be just Republicans, as you're all saying. Um, I suppose the que a couple of questions, most of my questions are probably more towards Sinn Féin, to be honest with you, in terms of that's who I, um, I feel are, are maybe most tied in 
with the system as it is, with the state as it is, with the, the parameters that's been set as they are. And I suppose my question is, probably a different question, but the first one comes to my head is, um, have you used any tactics? Have you sort of thought about anything in terms of how you're going to pressure the government? As to what sort of question is going to be um, in terms of whether it's going to be a republic or not? You know, have you used any tactics or, or anything to, to, to try and pressure the government to, to have a, a, a question that has that on the table instead of just simply Irish unity? Or, you know, what, what kind of um, Irish unity is going to be? Is the British occupation going to be removed? How, how much is going to insist on that there? Uh, and then I suppose we'll do the same thing to the IRSP as well then. Um, and oh, and another question really, I suppose. Um, if you can't get the question that we're wanting in terms of it being an Irish Republic, are you on for us organising, as the Catalonians have done, organising our own referendum, our own all Ireland national referendum, um, and, uh, and, and just doing it? And, uh, and if not, even if it doesn't actually um, change anything, would you not agree that it's, it's a man? The political party is going to deliver this on its own or has the ability or capacity to do so. But what we need to do is look at the range of interests that need, have a necessity to find that type of sovereign democratic republic. We have to look at, for example, the campaigns that our friend, our comrade talked about in the safest barren mountains. We've got to talk about the campaigns that will determine whether a republic is how valuable that republic becomes. We've got to engage with the movement of organised labour as it demands an end to zero hour contracts, as it asks for a working week, come as you stay, to a living, a decent living wage, not a, a nominal living wage. Those are issues that can only be guaranteed through a sovereign, independent workers' republic. We've got to build that movement to do so. That when we're talking about ending partition and building a republic, that people the working people, which constitute the majority of those on this island, have a vested interest in its establishment. Just as over a hundred years ago, the peasant farming community of Ireland saw the necessity to break away from the aristocracy, and the only way to break the aristocracy was to establish a republic. They learned the lesson from France, that there was no famine in France once they put an end to the aristocracy and returned the land to the peasantry. We've got to give people that incentive to establish the Republic. So we've got to build a broad alliance. I'm not talking across class, I'm talking about a, a, a broad alliance within the working class. Because let's keep in mind that the ruling class as it stands at the moment, in Dublin and in here and in the North, the governing class in Dublin depends on the European Union and the British finance for its position. Just as the British depend on the southern ruling class for its influence in the Republic. You cannot expect, and with all due respect, Brian, you cannot depend on the blue shirts. The blue shirts will not endorse a workers' republic. So let's keep in mind, go back to old James Connolly. James Connolly identified these problems over a hundred, he's a, over a hundred years dead it would do us well to but reflect on the words of James Connolly and his concepts. At the end of the day, only the working class will deliver a sovereign, independent republic. Uh, okay. I thought you were going to get up to speak. <laughs> um, Folks, I'll take a more set of three questions. Um, Um, the EU is um, inherently uh, capitalist. This is go back to the EU, of course. Um, and if there was to be, say, for instance, a referendum on leaving the European Union, um, is, do you think it's a legitimate fear that the agenda will be set by the media? And how do you think we could combat it? Any more questions here, folks? It's gone. Thanks for coming here tonight. tonight. Um, but I hear a lot of talk tonight about socialism, you know, busting up the bankers and the corporations. But just take a look around you at this town now at the moment. You know, we have Asda, KFC, Domino's, Costa, every corporation that's going has leached onto this town. So if we can't trust you to keep this town safe from the corporates, 
How can we trust you to get it out of Ireland? Take another question, folks. So we could all have a song contest. You know what I mean? It, it, the EU was founded to, to, to smash the workers' movement yeah. following World War Two and to stop the growth of the Soviet Union. That was a, it. Was a, it was an American idea. Um, we have to just keep saying that the media, the media, the media will do what the media do all over the world. They'll, they'll side with who's going to fund them. You know, um, we, uh, you know, it kind of ties in with, with, with another friend's question. Is saying you can't, how can you we trust it? You can't don't trust any organisation on this table that delivers to Japan and anything. You know, because political parties or political organisations on the by themselves have, don't don't bring change. Well, change this country is a ma um, it's awakening. A currently stagnant working class. You know, we've I've never seen that in my lifetime. I've seen the, the, the spurts of of what can happen when we start to go down that road. When we start to go down that road, um, anything is possible. Absolutely, anything anything will be possible. But the, you know, I mean, the best way I can say it. There's, see if see if any party, including my own, starts to say to you, "We have the answers. Get in behind us. Run, run away." <laughs> well, you know, we're we're we are we are. Quickly realised that change, change in the 21st century has to has to take place in a in, in a broad front format, albeit aided and hopefully guided correctly and honourably by by individual it's not parties. Party, like, I, I don't know. How long again? How long have we got? <laughs> so so far, no one here. As I said, utterly fledgling state. But in saying that, there's people doing. There's some great examples out there. The minute of, of how how how, uh, how Irish society is being being shaken. You know, there's there's an undercurrent of undercurrent of youth who are now realising that they grew up in a false economy, and who, who are starting to be like, go on all night. Look, don't lose hope. Like. Don't become cynical because that that is ultimately what you know, the other comrade in the back wants. The, the sorry, not you. The media that you speak of. Yeah. That's what they want. They want you to be cynical. They want you to yeah. do to turn around to become inwards. To say, listen, I'm just everybody's out to get whatever they can on the back of everybody else. I just join that club. That's what that's what they want. And don't like, well, play, don't fall into that trap because you don't have to. There is another way. No, I agree with you in saying that. At the end of the day, the European Union there is there to protect a certain class of people. It doesn't there to protect uh, workers' rights, and it won't do that. And the media will feed into that. The media will uh, tell you that Europe is the best thing ever. But in fact, it is. There's no, there's no gains uh, uh, in Europe. It does need. I was going to say reform, but it probably needs more than that. But the reality is, 57 percent of the people on this island and the six counties voted to, to remain. Um, and that there has been some benefits in terms of the peace money and stuff like that there. Uh, and but you're right. It's a watch for it for just to be careful uh, and in that direction. Um, in terms of change what parties, what, what changes have been. There has been change. Ireland is shaping different now altogether. You had the same sex marriage. That was all brought together uh, rightly for across all the parties. 
that's a big change, that's a big step for society. The repeal of the eighth, there's parties coming together and making uh, making a strong argument for women's rights, women for public rights. They are they are big things. They're, there's things that are changing. The, the the point they're getting there is that we have to do this as a collective. We don't do this as a collective, then we won't make the big changes that are that are necessary to shape the future. Um, uh, for me, uh, kind of comes back to the same stuff. Um, Europe, uh, how to combat corporate capitalism. For me, the way to do that is we first off need to restore the Irish Republic. It's not to be repetitive, but that's that's the only way that I can see us uh, arriving at the freedom to pursue such uh, such objectives. Um, once you once you do that, I suppose then change. Will that be removing ourselves from the European Union, changing the policy in terms of relationship between Ireland and outside corporations? Those are matters for the Irish people to decide um, through the democratic processes of the Republic. So the key thing is we need to get that Republic, and that's probably. Or I think the focus should be at this moment in time. Well, there is a Republic of Ireland at the moment. It's a tax haven. You know what I mean? It is a tax haven. I understand that, but um, the, the Republic of Ireland, the so-called Republic of Ireland, is, n is not the Irish Republic. It, it's a, a state, a 26-county state, established under uh, British political theory through the Government of Ireland Act and the Treaty of Surrender. What, what we are, what we in the societies are looking to do, is to re-establish the Irish Republic established under the 1916 Proclamation, and in that, in that Republic, it speaks of the ownership of Ireland for the people of Ireland. It, so, it speaks about cherishing all the children of the nation equally. And uh, in, in, a, in a Republic, premised on that document, the obligation of the state. Is to is to work off that line, and for me, that's the route we need to be looking at here. How do we get? How do we restore the Irish Republic? Okay, um, I think it's clearly necessary to define what we mean by a republic. George Gilmer, one of the founders of the Republican Congress, in his later years, said that any state can call itself a republic, but it's how it's defined is is is, is, is what it means. Uh, long ago, I remember hearing, many years ago, uh, in, in prison, we used to say about the South Africa, the Republic of South Africa, which only because it cannot determine the value of its own currency. Why I talk about Dominion status never really having ended. Between 1922 and 1975, the Dublin government, the 26-county state, was tied to British sterling. Those of you that are old enough to remember, and I am one, you must have remembered where the Irish pound issued by the Bank of Ireland in Dublin could be exchanged widely here in the north and vice versa. They were the same currency. And once you tie your currency to something else, it means that you cannot deviate, you cannot what they call reflate your economy. <coughs> you can't run a deficit. Moreover, the Irish economy is bound by the rules of the Single European Act taking all of that into consideration. And when you want to find out what happens, you look at what happened in 2010 when Dublin and the economic crisis come. And the Dublin government agreed to pay about 40% of the European bank debt because it was incapable of resisting the European Union's orders to pay the bondholders. Sovereignty may ask if you're talking about the 26 counties, if you're talking about the Dominion status, a failed state. The evidence of a failed state south of the border Okay, if you're Larry Goodman, if you're Dennis O'Brien, you're doing very nicely. But there's 10,000 people homeless. That's not counting those that are living on, so living on sofas, that are, that are paying exorbitant rents. There's 10,000 people homeless. There's half a million people on waiting lists. There's a two-tier health system which is deemed by independent analysis as the second most unequal in the European Union. That's what we have got as a result of the vassal state that is the 26 counties. I don't have to emphasize to you what condition we're in here in the north. 
thanks to the London government. So that's the conditions we're in. We've got to look at both, not just the European Union, not just London. We've got to get rid of both because we've got to establish sovereignty. And it can be done. But we're heading in a direction now where we're going to be faced with that, if you like, fork in the road. Do we travel down the road which allows our sovereignty to be challenged? Just because we have removed partition, we find ourselves back in the status of the vassal, or do we assert our sovereignty? That's the choice that we're going to have to make, and it's something we're going to have to battle very hard to advocate for. Go ahead. No, 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 no. To follow up, Professor Tommy, you talked about the, the, the big decisions that were made in the 26 counties, which were unthinkable some time ago, uh, particularly in reference to the legal redefining of what constitutes marriage mm-hmm. and the very, very difficult, um, the very, very difficult subject of abortion. Call it whatever else you want, but that's it's a very difficult subject. Would you agree that two of the big casualties was free thought and free speech during those debates? Or so, particularly within Republicanism, what, what, what is supposed to be Republicanism? Well, <coughs> I mean, Republicanism is a is, is very white, it's a white, broad church. Um, I, mean, I, I don't know, uh, Plunkett, if you could say there was an, an absence of free speech. I, I don't know if anybody was restricted from speaking. There was a consensus developed in support of. Uh, consensus developed both in support of civic marriage and abortion. The access, r- women's right to choose. I mean, it, it's 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 not forced on anybody any more than divorce is forced on anybody. But I mean, they, these can be t- defined in terms of civil liberties, which my opinion is that it's it's, it's a matter of personal conscience. I, I'm not talking about the. I'm not talking about free, but I'm just talking about the terms of, for instance, within New Zealand, they simply closed down any debate. And if you take, for instance, Rory Jacob, when Rory Jacob put up on a, his, what his view was, it happened to be no. Whether it was yes, whether it was the white defender's right to put it up. But the moment he put it up, the keyboard warriors and all the social soldiers were laughing and said, you can't even say this. Well, what listen. I'm saying is, if we're going to develop a structure, there's going to have to be a lot more elasticity of mind. And there's going to have to be a lot of, if, if, the public, if, if the Republicans are to have their say, the Republicans are going to have to be free have free speech and free thought and it cannot be a case of this is what it is in the box take well I mean the, the, the Im- implied in that is question that should be re- directed towards Sinn Féin and I'm not going to either attack or defend Sinn Féin's p- position on that they're entitled Sinn Féin's entitled to I set well look, look look no Sinn Féin's entitled to set out its own position <laughs> there the, 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 this comes within party discipline, and I, I, you know, if Sinn Féin wants to exercise party discipline, that's up to the members of Sinn Féin, to be honest. Uh, you know, they used to say about, when you questioned Lenin on the question of belief in God, Lenin said, it has to be free choice to everybody in society, but not in the party. So, I mean, and I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'd have to confess to being a Leninist. All right. Thanks. Hello. Thanks for all coming here tonight. I'd just like to ask the panel the respect of um, political parties that they represent. Uh, the program that Tommy touched on, the Dial First Dial program, there's a good uh, possibility that that could be reviewed and brought up to modern standards. I would uh, be the principle of that all political parties, progressive parties, could adhere to and give their support to, and more so that they could build the organisational capacity around that programme to bring people up to go for a referendum or border poll. I just like your views on that. Right here. Just to bring it back a wee bit to referendum or border poll and strategically, there's not a lot of things are coming together on. But there's one way that was coming together on, and that's the demonization of other Republicans.
front of me. Two wells of over thrown steel. One's by armed struggle and the other one's by a mass movement. The first one failed, so I think the rest speaks for itself. Thank you. I'm just trying to address the, uh, the point that Sean made. I don't think anybody here is on the illusion that and just United Ireland Dublin rule that I think the majority of people come here tonight on the basis that we know there's going to be a new, a new constitution, a new Ireland a unified Ireland on the Republican party and leftists and all types of groups to decide that Ireland and how it's going to be done uh, basically, I would, uh, would ask what options you would put forward to attract other groups to your opinion on that republic, the 1916-1818 republic, because I see, being somebody who grew up and come through the last 50 odd years, I see it has to be change and has to be forward thinking, so they bring the youth and all those that are not aware of the original ideals of republicanism, because it has to be flexible to adapt to a new Ireland. Not a new Ireland on their own rule, but a new Ireland ruled by the people. Thanks, Danny. That was nearly one continuous question there. Danny, do you want me to just burst and go for it? Okay. Um, in terms of putting down a program that people will see as attractive, see as valuable, I think it's also important to me put it in a program that people see as absolutely necessary to their well-being. I think that brings us round to our comrade at the end, at the back, speaking about the democratic program, the revision, revised, reviewed democratic program. Because, I might as well say it, you can see some of these pamphlets here tonight. There will be an effort made in January of next year to celebrate the first doll and with it the democratic program. And I think it's imperative now that we set out a programme for the 21st century which identifies what we can do within that new republic. I would argue again for a workers' republic is the only viable alternative to what we have, but that we've got to assure people. And there are huge implications in this. Implications for our sovereignty, but also implications in terms of where we're heading. Because we cannot, we cannot ignore the existence of one million unionists in this part of the world. Now, there's three things I always say we're not going to do in the event of a united Ireland. We're not going to shoot them, we're not going to intern them, and we're not going to expel them because we're not Nazis. So we've got to come to terms with our neighbours, however difficult that's going to be. Let me tell you this, one thing we can't, there's no point telling them of the advantages of Cayley dancing or the Irish language, or watching RTE on a Sunday evening. They're, 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 they're all fine things to do, but you're hardly going to win much with that. We have got to tell people that there's a hard reality to the new republic, where they'll get a home, where they'll get a job, where they'll not be cold, they'll not be hungry, they'll not be looked abandoned in their old age. That's the type of thing that we can offer, and that's what we will be offering. Nothing else, no gestures, but hard, solid reality. And that's what we can do under a new democratic program to talk sense to those people that are no longer, or never were, are not, are not currently convinced of the value, in fact are opposed to it. Because we're going to have to engage and talk to those people realistically. There are things we can't do, but there's things we can in terms of engaging with them. And also engaging across the island to tell people that it's not just a nice thing to have a republic. It might be, but it's an absolute necessity to have this workers' republic if we're to have a life that's worth living and it's worth offering to our country, men and women. Well, of course. Um, the appropriate place for rights for minorities and protections, constitutional protections, whatever, only because it cannot determine the value of its own currency. 
Why I talk about Dominion status never really having ended. Between 1922 and 1975, the Dublin government, the 26 county state, was tied to British sterling. Those of you that are old enough to remember, and I'm one, you must have remembered where the Irish pound issued by the Bank of Ireland in Dublin could be exchanged widely here in the north and vice versa. They were the same currency. And once you tie your currency to something else, it means that you cannot deviate, you cannot <coughs> reflate your economy. <coughs> you can't run a deficit. Moreover, the Irish economy is bound by the rules of the Single European Act, taking all of that into consideration. And when you want to find out what happens, you look at what happened in 2010 when Dublin and the economic crisis come, and the Dublin government agreed to pay about 40% of the European bank debt because it was incapable of resisting the European Union's orders to pay the bondholders. Sovereignty may ask if you're talking about the 26 counties, if you're talking about the Dominion status, a failed state. The evidence of a failed state south of the border, okay, if you're Larry Goodman, if you're Dennis O'Brien, you're doing very nicely, but there's 10,000 people homeless. That's not counting those that are living on, so living on sofas, that are, that are paying exorbitant rents. There's 10,000 people homeless. There's half a million people on waiting lists. There's a two-tier health system which is deemed by independent analysis as the second most unequal in the European Union. That's what we have got as a result of the vassal state that is the 26 counties. I don't have to emphasize to you what condition we're in here in the north, thanks to the London government. So that's the conditions we're in. We've got to look at both, not just the European Union, not just London. We've got to get rid of both because we've got to establish sovereignty and it can be done. But we're heading in a direction now where we're going to be faced with that, if you like, fork in the road. Do we travel down the road which allows our sovereignty to be challenged? Just because we have removed partition, we find ourselves back in the status of a vassal, or do we assert our sovereignty? That's the choice that we're going to have to make, and it's something we're going to have to battle very hard to advocate. Sorry, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no problem. Just to follow up, Professor Tommy, you talked about the, the, the big decisions that were made in the 26 counties, which were unthinkable some time ago, uh, particularly with reference to the legal redefining of what constitutes marriage, yes, and the very, very difficult, um, the very, very difficult subject of abortion. Call it whatever else you want, but that's it's a very difficult subject. Would you agree that two of the big casualties was free thought? Free speech during those debates, or so, particularly within Republicanism, or what, what, what is supposed to be Republican. Well, <coughs> I mean, Republicanism is a is, is very wide, it's a wide, broad church. Um, I, I don't know, Col uh, Plunkett, if you could say there was an, an absence of free speech. I, I don't know if anybody was restricted from speaking. There was a consensus developed in support of, uh, consensus developed both in support of civic marriage and abortion, access, r women's right to choose, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not forced on anybody any more than divorce is forced on anybody, but, I mean, th these can be t defined in terms of civil liberties, which my opinion is that it's, it's, it's a matter of personal conscience. I, I'm not talking about the, I'm not talking about the field, but I'm just talking about in terms of, for instance, within New Zealand field, they simply closed down any debate. And if you take, for instance, Rory Jacob, when Rory Jacob put up on a, his, what his view was, it happened to be no. Whether it was yes, or whether it was the white defender's right to put it up. But the moment he put it up, the keyboard warriors and anti-social soldiers were laughing and said, you can't say this. Well, what listen. What I'm saying is, if we're going to develop a structure, there's going to have to be a lot more elasticity of mind, and there's going to have to be a lot of, if, if, Republic, if, if Republicans are to have their say, Republicans are going to have to be free, to have free speech and free thought, and it cannot be a case of this is what it is in the box taken. Well, I mean, the, the, the implied in that is a question that should be directed towards Sinn Féin, and I'm not going to either attack or defend Sinn Féin's position on that. They're entitled, Sinn Féin's entitled to set... Well, look, 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 no, Sinn Féin's entitled to set out its own position. They're, 
the, 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 this comes within party discipline, and I, I, you know, if Sinn Féin wants to exercise party discipline, that's up to the members of Sinn Féin, to be honest. Uh, you know, they used to say about, when you questioned Lenin on the question of belief in God, Lenin said, it has to be free choice to everybody in society, but not in the party. So, I mean, and I, I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'll have to confess to being a Leninist. All right. Thanks. Hello. Thanks for all coming here tonight. I'd just like to ask the panel, the respective um, political parties that they represent, uh, the program that Tommy touched on, the Dial First Dial program, there's a good uh, possibility that that could be reviewed and brought up to modern standards. I would uh, be the principle of that all political parties, progressive parties, could adhere to and give their support to, and more so that they get all the organisational capacity around that program to bring people up to go for a referendum or border poll. I'd just like your views on that. Uh, just to bring it back a wee bit to referendum or border poll and strategically, there's not a lot of difference in what the are coming together on. But there's one way that was coming together on, and that's the demonization of other Republicans. Two ways of overthrowing the state. One's by armed struggle and the other one's by a mass movement. The first one failed, so I think the rest speaks for itself. Thank you. I'm just trying to address the, uh, the point that Sean made. I don't think anybody here is under the illusion that see as attractive, see as valuable. I think it's also important to me put it in a program that people see as absolutely necessary to their well-being. I think that brings us round to our comrade at the end, at the back, speaking about the democratic program, the revision, revised, reviewed democratic program. Because I might as well say it, you can see some of these pamphlets here tonight. There will be an effort made in January of next year to celebrate the first of all and with it the democratic program and I think it's imperative now that we set out a program for the 21st century which identifies what we can do within that new republic. I would argue again for a workers republic is the only viable alternative to what we have but that we've got to assure people and there are huge implications in this implications for our sovereignty but also implications in terms of where we're heading because we cannot, we cannot 
ignore the existence of one million unionists in this part of the world. Now, there's three things I always say we're not going to do in the event of a united Ireland. We're not going to shoot them, we're not going to intern them, and we're not going to expel them because we're not Nazis. So we've got to come to terms with our neighbours, however difficult that's going to be. Let me tell you this, one thing we can't, there's no point telling them of the advantages of Cayley dancing or the Irish language or watching RTE on a Sunday evening. They're, they're, they're all fine things to do, but you're hardly going to win much with that. We have got to tell people that there's a hard reality to the new republic where they'll get a home, where they'll get a job, where they'll not be cold, they'll not be hungry, they'll not be looked abandoned in their old age. That's the type of thing that we can offer, and that's what we will be offering. Nothing else, no gestures, but hard, solid reality. And that's what we can do under a new democratic program, to talk sense to those people that are no longer, or never were, are not, are not currently convinced of the value, in fact, are opposed to it. Because we're going to have to engage and talk to those people realistically. There are things we can't do, but there's things we can in terms of engaging with them and also engaging across the island to tell people that it's not just a nice thing to have a republic. It might be, but it's an absolute necessity to have this workers' republic if we're to have a life that's worth living and it's worth offering to our country, men and women. Well, of course. Um, the appropriate place for rights for minorities and protections, constitutional protections, whatever. The world symbolic thing as well. So that's those quite a couple of questions. Yeah, no, uh, I think I'll just, what Brendan was saying there, panel, that um, the, the difference between British and Irishness now is we, as we move towards um, a referendum and needs to be defined. Um, our other comrade here was saying that. Uh, is it is a Hong Kong style type 50 year transition process and the 32 county framework acceptable? And the, the, our, our other question there, um, just about the, the the transition process as well, Kieran. So if you want to go first, yeah. Uh, the, the the matter of the Secretary of State having the having the, the power to call this, it, 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 it sticks in everybody's throat, every meeting they do, it, it does, I, under, I understand it. Um, uh, listen, this dynamic arguably exists in every aspect of Republican slaves. That dynamic existed when the armed struggle was on. It, you, were, you were, you know, it came down eventually to demanding, demanding peace talks from the state. Uh, it existed during the civil rights campaign dynamic. You know, rights being gifted. It, demand, it, it arguably exists in, in scenarios such as judicial reviews where people are demanding, you know, it, uh, one organisation uh, accused us of uh, looking for, asking for crumbs from the master's table, deliberately demeaning, it, it, so it deserves half a response, you know. That, if you want to look at things that way, you can. What we would say is, we're not asking them from the sector to state, we're going to demand, we're demanding this, we're organising towards demanding this. Uh, just the same as our parents demanded decent houses, just the same as our grandparents demanded one one iron one vote. You can choose to interpret it uh, as as a, a gift from the Lords above or whatever. Um, I I wouldn't disempower my party or my movement by framing it in that in those those terms. Um, regards our other comrade asked here about tactics towards tactics towards physically demanding uh, a border poll and the right type of border poll, the right type of referendum. I think it's very important to say that we're, we're clearly in a real fledgling stage here now. You know, um, we have what we are envisaging, envisaging here is bringing this debate, as, as we said in press conferences around this meeting, down from the hands of mainstream politicians and, and into the living rooms, into the classrooms, into, into the shop, uh, the factory floors, etc. Uh, and um, really making people aware of their own power, M making people aware that Jesus, when we take that, we, we were in Catalonia and I was really blown away, honest about it. You, um, there, there was this. You, you sense without trying to sound romantic, like you had a situation wherein, uh, you know, pensioners who were probably victims of the old Franco regime, they were, they were, they were of that age and suffered horrifically under under the old Spanish regime. Who were probably too fragile and who didn't have the agility to come out in March. Could only show their um, 
their resistance through uh, coming out on the balconies and Barcelona was just balconies ever and banging pots and pans and it was, it was scary like it was scary to 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 feel to feel that because what, what you have there is you have a, a population which was once arguably politically stagnant on the streets and the power the power from such a such an initiative is arguably in, in you know infinite um we see, in the such a situation we think it's win-win even if, if we manage to mobilize people in that type even in a fraction of, of what of, of, of what we've seen there then even if the let's let's be frank even if the brits dirty joes and they have form for it it's win-win because we've mobilized the, the one stagnant population and whatever happens after that's their fault thank you Kieran. Uh, first of all so uh Britain's point trying to address that there in terms of passports and people should feel free first of all your question was are we irish and british absolutely irish 100 percent what i'm what i'm saying is that people should people will have irish passport and some people are british and some people will feel free to have that there should be no restriction or any of the other uh or, or british or irish and people will have that choice that's but you will have a definitely bureaucrats and stuff like that who will try and tell you that no, you know, you need. Friend, just to add that, that point, that they, 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 were, they were telling her that she was British mm. because she was born in Northern Ireland, even though she held an Irish passport. That was the difference that was trying to make them And uh, yeah. First of all, Blunk, it's good to see you. It's been a few years since, we, since we, we've been together, but it's good to see you. First of all, this isn't going to be a, a Hong, Kong, Hong Kong style type of a, situation 75 years down the line absolutely not i do believe there is a momentum here now Blunkett, and i think it's an opportunity for us to seize it the uh, i believe that within five years that you would see a border pole and it's shortly after that there i believe that united ireland is firmly on on the, on that course in a shorter time than Plunkett you would imagine in 75 years the point I was making about the Irish government is that no one else is going to do this on our own. Absolutely not. And you will reluctantly or otherwise have to include all parties who are prepared, or who support the United Ireland, will have to be the Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, the Labour, and it will be a accumulation of a group of people like that who will drive, drive this process forward. In terms of um, tactics respect to yourself, is that them tactics will come from the people. We don't have all the answers in terms of what the tactics will be for the referendum. That will be for a broad-based yes campaign to come together to look at tactics. And for every argument, there is a counter-argument. But it won't just come from Sinn Féin. Not, it's not even possible. As a collective of minds that will, decel, that will decide what the argument is and what the process, process will be. Um, uh, the core concern, I think Brian spoke about an opportunity uh, with a border pole, uh, but as I was trying to speak about in my contribution, uh, the, the key concern here is not about um, whether or not, there's, it's not necessarily about whether this vote can be won. The real concern lies, and if we get this vote and we, and we do win it, uh, what are the parameters of the process that follows that? And, and nowhere has this been set out. And we see now all the time in the media this playing out, this conditioning process, and it all revolves around the talk of a new agreed Ireland. So we don't no longer hear uh, people talking about the Irish Republic. We no longer hear about the All Ireland Republic. We hear all the time now this new agreed Ireland. And we hear about the requirement to respect. Britishness in this new agreed Ireland. And um, we see this, uh, but somebody referred to earlier about this rehabilitation of the of the British in Ireland. And it all seems to me it is heading in the direction of we get this border pole, it passes, then we're into a renegotiation of the Good Friday Agreement. And those that Good Friday framework, the three strands the relationships within the north, the relationships between the north and the south, and the relationships between the island of Ireland and the island of Britain, that the new constitutional framework 
We hear these people talk about we need to reconfigure the constitutional arrangements between these islands. So this is where it's going. It's going towards reconfiguring the Good Friday Agreement with a different emphasis perhaps on the roles between Dublin, London and the North. And we're also hearing through all this same process that the, nor the Northern State will continue post the Yes Vote Border Poll. So where is the Irish Republic in this process? And I don't mean to be critical of the people that's campaigning on this line, but what I'm saying is we have to be aware that this is the ground we're moving on to. Now, how do we respond to that? Do we respond by just rejecting everything and saying we're taking no part in that? Or do we organise? And if we're to organise, we have to organise for the Republic. Yes, um, I suppose in response to Plunkett's question about the possibility of what's possibly described as the Hong Kong situation of a 50-year transitionary period, whether it's a Hong Kong situation or whether it's, it's what would have been called in 1922 Dominion status, Dominion status doesn't necessarily always mean that we're Dominion of Britain, we could also be a Dominion of the European Union. And if you look at the European Union's process at the moment, Angela Merkel and Macron are adv advocating a European, an EU army, one army in the European Union, which in itself indicates that when coupled with their policies on economics, the danger is that we're leaving one empire to find ourselves enmeshed in another empire. And that's one of the problems that we've got to be very careful about. That Domination does no longer necessarily mean that we're occupied with, by troops, that we're sitting watching the redcoats marching up and down the road. If the European Union and the British, the City of London controls our finances, controls our foreign policy, controls our security policy, then we are tenants in our own home. We, we, we don't have sovereign authority. That is something we've got to guard against at all costs. Now. There's very little doubt in my mind that Britain wishes and desires to exercise influence over this island, whether it's partitioned or whether there's a British army sitting in Ballymena or not, it will be determined to exercise influence through those sophisticated methods in doing so. By the same token, we can find that the European Union, which at the moment, the Dublin government has to substitute or submit its budget annually to Brussels for approval. So again, how far does sovereignty go within those circumstances? If we don't be very careful, we could end up seeing an end of partition and finding ourselves with less sovereignty than we even have at the moment. And sovereignty is the ultimate goal that we can decide what we wish to do for the best interests of our people. That, that, that's, that's what we're fighting for. It's not simply to have a United Ireland. Let me tell you about a United Ireland. Lord Edward Carson favoured a United Ireland. Lord Kilcluny John Taylor favours a United Ireland, and needless to say, of course, within the United Kingdom. But a United Ireland of itself, without us having control, having sovereignty, means li little or nothing. So we'll have to talk about exercising sovereignty and to do so through the people. In terms of tactics, what I would suggest we consider is that we have to build the movement, the mass of people, because no one organisation, no one political party is going to deliver this on its own or has the ability or capacity to do so. But what we need to do is look at the range of interests that need, have a necessity to find that type of sovereign democratic republic. We have to look at, for example, the campaigns that our friend, our comrade talked about to save the Sparrow Mountains. We've got to talk about the campaigns that will determine whether a republic is how valuable that republic becomes. We've got to engage with the movement of organised labour as it demands an end to zero hour contracts, as it asks for a working week, come as you stay, to a living, a decent living wage, not a, a nominal living wage. Those are issues that can only be guaranteed through a sovereign, independent workers' republic. We've got to build that movement to do so. That when we're talking about ending partition and building a republic, that people working people, which constitute the majority of those on this island, 
have a vested interest in its establishment. Just as over a hundred years ago, the peasant farming community of Ireland saw the necessity to break away from the aristocracy and the only way to break the aristocracy was to establish a republic. They learned the lesson from France that there was no famine in France once they put an end to the aristocracy and returned the land to the peasantry. We've got to give people that incentive to establish the republic. So we've got to build a broad alliance. I'm not talking across class, I'm talking about a, a, a broad alliance within the working class. Because let's keep in mind that the ruling class as it stands at the moment in Dublin and in here and in the north the governing class in Dublin depends on the European Union and the British finance for its position just as the British depend on the southern ruling class for its influence in the Republic you cannot expect and with all due respect Brian you cannot depend on the blue shirts the blue shirts will not endorse a workers republic So let's keep in mind, go back to old James Connolly. James Connolly identified these problems over 100, he's a, over 100 years dead. It would do us well to but reflect on the words of James Connolly and his concepts. At the end of the day, only the working class will deliver a sovereign independent republic. Uh, okay. You were going to get up this week. <laughs> um, Folks, I'll take a more set of three questions. Um, um, the EU is um, inherently uh, capitalist. This is brought back to the EU, of course. Um, and if there was to be, say, for instance, a referendum on leaving the European Union, um, is, do you think it's a legitimate fear that the agenda will be set by the media? And how do you think we could combat it? Any more questions here, folks? How's it going? Thanks for coming here tonight. tonight. Um, but I hear a lot of talk tonight about socialism, you know, busting up the bankers and the corporations. But just take a look around you at this town now at the moment. You know, we have ASDA, KFC, Domino's, Costa, every corporation that's going has leached onto this town. So if we can't trust you to keep this town safe from the corporates, how can we trust you to get it out of Ireland? Take another question, folks. Yeah, I don't need to make just that. Uh, very interesting conversation, very important stuff like the James said. But you know, it's the sort of rhetoric that's being used, and we, you know, getting away from this. You know, we need to engage everybody. The big thing in this room tonight is the lack of women. You know, and how do we engage them? How do we engage the youth and talk in a language that they understand? You know, and get them on board with this project. So that's it. Uh, I think that's a question, folks, of um, the the European Union and, and and how do you dispel the myths that the European Union is, is good for the Irish people and uh, about engaging youth and then about how, how to combat um, corporate capitalism. You reinforce the truth, you know, as we've done in this document. You know, uh, the European Union isn't about Euro European Union isn't about giving young yeah, people and the real cards. You know, the media are going to say that. The media are going to say it's about, you know, the EU was founded so we could all have a song contest. You know what I mean? It, it, the EU was founded to, to smash the workers' move yeah. following World War II and to stop the growth of the Soviet Union. That was a, it. Was a, it was an American idea. Um, we have to just keep saying that they meet this and the media, the media will do what the media do all over the world. They'll, they'll side with who's going to fund them. You know, um, we, uh, you know, it kind of ties in with, with, with the other friend's question is, is saying, you can't, how can you we trust it? You can't, don't trust any organisation on this table that delivers to anything. 
you know, because political parties or political organisations on the, by themselves have, don't don't bring change. Well, change this country is a ma um, it's awakening a currently stagnant working class. You know, we've I've never seen that in my lifetime. I've seen the, the, the spurts of of what can happen when we start to go down that road. When we start to go down that road, um, anything is possible. Absolutely, anything anything will be possible. But you no, know, I mean the best way I can say it. There's see if see if any party, including my own, starts to say to you, "We have the answers. Get in behind us. Run, run away." <laughs> We you know we're, we're, we are we are quickly realised that change change in the 21st century has to has to take place in a in, in a broad front format, albeit aided and hopefully guided correctly and honourably by, by individual it's not parties. Party, like, you know, I, I don't know. How long again? How long have we got? So so far. No one here, as I said, utterly fledgling state. But, but uh, in saying that, there's been people doing. There's some great examples out there. At the minute of, of how 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 uh, how our society is being being shaken. You know, there's there's an undercurrent of undercurrent of youth who are now realising that they grew up in a false economy, and who, who are starting to be like, going on like, look, don't lose hope, like. don't become cynical, because that that is ultimately what you know, the other comrade in the back wants. The, the sorry, not you, the media that you speak of. Yeah. That's what they want. They want you to be cynical. They want you to do to turn around to become inwards to say, "Listen, I'm just everybody's out to get whatever they can in the back of everybody else. I just join that club." That's what that's what they want. And don't I plead, don't fall into that trap because you don't have to. There is another way. No, I agree with you in saying that. At the end of the day, the European Union there is there to protect a certain class of people. It doesn't there to protect uh, workers' rights, and it won't do that. And the media will feed into that, the media will uh, tell you that Europe is the best thing ever, but in fact it is, there's no, there are no gains uh, uh, in Europe. It does need, I was going to say reform, but it probably needs more than that, but the reality is 57% of the people on this island, or in the six counties, voted to, to remain, um, and that there has been some benefits in terms of the peace money and stuff like that there. Uh, and but you're right, it's a watch for it for just to be careful uh, and in that direction. Um, in terms of change and what parties, what, what changes have been, there has been change. Ireland is shaping different now altogether. You had the same sex marriage, that was all brought together uh, rightly for across all the parties. That's a big change, that's a big step for society. The repeal of the eighth, there's parties coming together and making. Uh, making a strong argument for women's rights, re women for public rights. They are, they are big things. They're, there's things that are changing. The, the, the point of getting there is that we have to do this as a collective. If we don't do this as a collective, then we won't make the big changes that, that are necessary to shape the future. Um. Uh, for me, it uh, kind of comes back to the same stuff. Um, Europe, uh, how to combat corporate capitalism. For me, the way to do that is we first off need to restore the Irish Republic. It's not to be repetitive, but that's that's the only way that I can see us uh, arriving at the freedom to pursue such uh, such objectives. Um, once you once you do that, I suppose then change, whether that be removing ourselves from the European Union, changing the policy in terms of relationship between Ireland and outside corporations, those are matters for the Irish people to decide um, through the democratic processes of the Republic. So the key thing is we need to get that Republic and that's probably where I think the focus should be at this moment in time. I I understand that, but um, the the Republic of Ireland, the so-called Republic of Ireland, is n is not the Irish Republic. It, it's a, a state, a 26 county state established under uh, British political theory through the Government of Ireland Act and the Treaty of Surrender. What what we are what we in the societies are looking to do is to re-establish the Irish Republic established under the 1916 proclamation. And in that, 
in that republic, it speaks of the ownership of Ireland for the people of Ireland. It, so, it speaks about cherishing all the children of the nation equally. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a republic premised on that document, the obligation of the state is to, is to work off that line. And for me, that's the route we need to be looking at here. How do we, get, how do we restore the Irish Republic? Okay. Um, I think it's clearly necessary to define what we mean by a republic. George Gilmer, one of the founders of the Republican Congress in his later years, said that any state can call itself a republic, but it's how it's defined is, 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 is what it means. Uh, long ago, I remember hearing, many years ago, uh, in, in prison, we used to say about the South Africa, the Republic of South Africa, which was an apartheid state, the Republican Party in the United States, which arguably is an apartheid party. So, I mean, just because you call yourself a Republican or some state calls itself a Republic doesn't necessarily mean that it can deliver the goods. So, we have to be very careful about defining what we mean by a Republic. That's why I say we've got to talk of a workers' republic, we've got to build for a workers' republic, and we've got to say exactly what we mean by that, rather than just use it as a as a coverall for an all Ireland state. But there's a number of issues here I think very relevant have been raised. One, the idea of impacting or encouraging youth. I think that's a vital aspect of our work is to encourage youth. Molinaiga, as to say, um, I'm always optimistic about the youth because. I'm old enough now to remember several decades, but I remember certainly in the 60s, after 1966, a lot of the older generation talking about how uh, feet, how decadent, how pretty useless was this generation which were, were growing their hair long and singing Beatles songs and doing all sorts of desperate deeds. And within a couple of years, we had the place turned upside down. You know, so <coughs> things can change very quickly, and it's invariably the youth that will do it. So always, always put your faith on the youth. The old, it's, it's the old people. It's, it's, it's generations like mine that it, uh, and older people. We let the youth down. It's never the other way around. You know, so don't don't despair for youth. Um, the question of corporate capitalism. Well, corporate capitalism will be here as long as we allow cap corporate capitalism to remain here. Now we're going to have to battle with it in on a day-to-day -day basis to th push it back as best we can. The South African Communist Party during the days of apartheid used to say socialism is the future so let's start building it today. On that basis when we're talking about socialism we're talking about combating corporate capitalism we've got to get to work with it on it today to roll it back to fight with it on a day-to-day -day basis through organized labor, through organized political parties to force corporate capitalism <coughs> off the ground it's on, challenge it, but ultimately, ultimately, in the workers' republic, we'll nationalise them. That's what we'll do. That's how, how we overcome corporate capitalism. We take it into the possession of the people. The <coughs> Back to the question of the European Union and the media. The, um, the point about it is that opinions do change. As Brian talked about in the Republic of Ireland, over the last 10 years, we've seen incredible changes came about in terms of repealing the Eighth Amendment, in terms of bringing about recognizing civic marriage. The, the, those were changes that were inconceivable 10 or 20 years ago. So it's far from <coughs> impossible. But what we've got to be very careful about is the difference between social liberalism and economic democracy. <coughs> and this is one of the if you like, it, it, it's, it's one of the seductive processes or paths down which too many left-wing parties go. They equate social liberalism with economic democracy and they end up parting company with, and when I talk about economic democracy, I'm talking about taking the wealth of the people or restoring the wealth to the people. Um, so let's say that it's possible. We've got to then see how it's to be done. Uh, this is not something that's absolutely new. Within the next few months, we're going to be celebrating the centenary of the first doll, and with it, the democratic program. And the democratic program was a document which identified the absolute essential need to make wealth of this island available and to be used for the benefit of the people of this island. 
It's something that we have failed spectacularly to achieve in this century in the, in, in the interim. Obviously because we failed to establish the type of republic. Let's keep in mind also that the republic that we failed to establish it was overturned by counter-revolution. We lost the Civil War, unfortunately, and as a result of that, the reaction that set in thereafter brought us away from the ethos of that democratic program. We can reset this again, but we've got to do it by taking control through restoring sovereignty to the people. And the problem with the European Union, and this is where we have got to battle day and daily to explain to people that the European Union is one of the controlling mechanisms. We have British imperialism, we have European Union imperialism. The European Union is now advocating one single European army. They already have a con um, they already have what they call PESCO, which involves bringing different uh, states into a military arrangement. The Irish army has representatives, believe it or not, in Afghanistan, parts of southern North, Northern Africa. They are intimately involved, although ostensibly outside of NATO. Shamefully, they facilitate extraordinary rendition by making Shannon Airport available to the U.S. Army and its Air Force. Uh, you can question neutrality. There is no question of whether it exists. Within the European Union, we find the Republic of Ireland in the Eurozone. Now, the Euro might be convenient if you're going for a few days' holidays to the south of Europe. <coughs> But by hand, one of the greatest concessions to sovereignty is handing over control of your currency. The Dublin government is incapable of determining only because it cannot determine the value of its own currency. Why I talk about dominion status never really having ended. Between 1922 and 1975, the Dublin government, the 26 county state, was tied to British sterling. Those of you that are old enough to remember, and I'm one, you must have remembered where the Irish pound issued by the Bank of Ireland in Dublin could be exchanged widely here in the north and vice versa. They were the same currency. And once you tie your currency to something else, it means that you cannot deviate, you cannot what they call reflate to your economy. <coughs> you can't run a deficit. Moreover, the Irish economy is bound by the rules of the Single European Act taking all of that into consideration. And when you want to find out what happens, you look at what happened in 2010 when Dublin and the economic crisis come, and the Dublin government agreed to pay about 40% of the European bank debt because it was incapable of resisting the European Union's orders to pay the bondholders. Sovereignty may ask if you're talking about the 26 counties, if you're talking about the Dominion status, a failed state. The evidence of a failed state south of the border Okay, if you're Larry Goodman, if you're Dennis O'Brien, you're doing very nicely. But there's 10,000 people homeless. That's not counting those that are living on, so living on sofas, that are, that are paying exorbitant rents. There's 10,000 people homeless. There's half a million people on waiting lists. There's a two-tier health system which is deemed by independent analysis as the second most unequal in the European Union. That's what we have got as a result of the vassal state that is the 26 counties. I don't have to emphasize to you what condition we're in here in the north, thanks to the London government. So that's the conditions we're in. We've got to look at both, not just the European Union, not just London. We've got to get rid of both because we've got to establish sovereignty and it can be done. But we're heading in a direction now where we're going to be faced with that, if you like, fork in the road. Do we travel down the road which allows our sovereignty to be challenged just because we have removed partition, we find ourselves back in the status of the vassal, or do we assert our sovereignty? That's the choice that we're going to have to make, and it's something we're going to have to battle very hard to advocate. Sorry, Michael, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. Just to follow up, Tommy, you talked about the. the, the decisions that were made in the 26 counties which were unthinkable some time ago, uh, particularly with reference to the legal redefining of what constitutes marriage and the very, very difficult 
a very, very difficult subject of abortion. Call it whatever else you want, but that's it's a very difficult subject. Would you agree that two of the big casualties was free thought and free speech during those debates? Or so, particularly within Republicanism, or what, what, are, what are supposed to be Republicanism? Well, <coughs> I mean, Republicanism is a is, is a very wide it's a wide broad church. Um, I, mean, I, I don't know, uh, Plunkett, if you could say there was an, an absence of free speech. I, I don't know if anybody was restricted from speaking. There was a consensus developed in support of a consensus developed both in support of civic marriage and abortion, access, women's right to choose. I mean, it, it's 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 not forced on anybody any more than divorce is forced on anybody, but. I mean, they, these can be defined in terms of civil liberties, which my opinion is that it's, it's, it's a matter of personal conscience. Well, I, I'm not talking about the, I'm not talking about the but I'm just talking about in terms of, for instance, within New Sinn Féin, they simply closed down any debate. And if you take, for instance, Rory Jacob, when Rory Jacob got up on a, his, what his view was, it happened to be no, whether it was yes or whether it was the white defender's right to put it up. But the moment he got up, the keyboard warriors and all the social soldiers went after him and said, "You can't say this." Well, what I'm saying is, if we're going to develop a structure, there's going to have to be a lot more elasticity of mind, and there's going to have to be a lot of if the public, if Republicans are to have their say, Republicans are going to have to be free, to have free speech and free thought, and it cannot be a case of this is what it is in the box taken. Well, I mean, the, the, the implied in that is question that should be re directed towards Sinn Féin and I'm not going to either attack or defend Sinn Féin's position on that They're enti Sinn Féin's entitled to set well look, look, look no, no, Sinn Féin's entitled to set out its own position there, uh, the, 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 this comes within party discipline and I, I, you know if Sinn Féin wants to exercise party discipline that's up to the members of Sinn Féin to be honest uh, you know they used to say about when you questioned Lenin on the question of belief in God Lenin said, it has to be free choice to everybody in society, but not in the party. So, I mean, and I, I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'll have to confess to being a Leninist. All right. Thanks. Thank Hello. Thanks for all coming here tonight. I'd just like to ask the panel, the respective um, political parties that they represent, uh, the program that Tommy touched on, the Dial First Dial program, there's a good uh, possibility that that could be reviewed and brought up to modern standards. I would uh, be the principle that all political parties, progressive parties, could adhere to and give their support to, and more so that they get built uh, organizational capacity around that program to bring people up to go for a referendum or border poll. I just like your views on that. Right here. Uh, just to bring it back a wee bit to referendum or border poll and strategically there's not a lot of Republicans are coming together on but there's one way that was coming together on and that's the demonization of other Republicans. Two ways of overthrowing a state. One's by armed struggle and the other one's by a mass movement. The first one failed, so I think the rest speaks for itself. Thank you. I'm just trying to address and uh, the point that Sean made. I don't think anybody here is on the illusion that we partition and just put United Ireland, Dublin rule. That. I think the majority of people come here tonight on the basis that we know there's going to be a new, a new constitution, a new Ireland. A unified Ireland under Republican 
party and leftists and all types of groups to decide that Ireland and how it's going to be done. Uh, basically, I would, uh, would ask what options you would put forward to attract other groups to your opinion on that republic, the 1916-1818 republic, because I see being somebody who grew up and come through the last 50 odd years, I see it has to be change and has to be forward thinking for they bring the youth and all those that are not aware of the original ideals of republicanism because it has to be flexible to adapt to a new Ireland. Not a new Ireland under rule, but new Ireland ruled by the people. Thanks, Danny. That was nearly one continuous question there. Just Danny, do you want me to go first and go? Okay. Um, in terms of m m putting down a program that people will see as attractive, see as valuable, I think it's also important to put down a program that people see as absolutely necessary to their well-being. I think that brings us round to our comrade at the end, at the back, speaking about the democratic program, the re vision, revised, reviewed democratic program. Because I might as well say it, you can see some of these pamphlets here tonight. There will be an effort made in January of next year to celebrate the first doll and with it the democratic program. And I think it's imperative now that we set out a program for the 21st century which identifies what we can do within that new republic. I would argue again for a workers' republic is the only viable alternative to what we have, but that we've got to assure people. And there are huge implications in this, implications for our sovereignty, but also implications in terms of where we're heading, because we cannot, we cannot ignore the existence of one million unionists in this part of the world. Now, there's three things I always say we're not going to do in the event of a united Ireland. We're not going to shoot them, we're not going to intern them, and we're not going to expel them because we're not Nazis. So we've got to come to terms with our neighbours, however difficult that's going to be. Let me tell you this, one thing we can't, there's no point telling them of the advantages of Cayley dancing, or the Irish language, or watching RTE on a Sunday evening. I, 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 all fine things to do. But you're hardly going to win much with that. We have got to tell people that there's a hard reality to the new republic, where they'll get a home, where they'll get a job, where they'll not be cold, they'll not be hungry, they'll not be looked abandoned in their old age. That's the type of thing that we can offer, and that's what we will be offering. Nothing else, no gestures, but hard, solid reality. And that's what we can do under a new democratic program, to talk sense to those people that are no longer or never were, are not, are not currently convinced of the value, in fact are opposed to it, because we're going to have to engage and talk to those people realistically. There are things we can't do, but there's things we can in terms of engaging with them, and also engaging across the island to tell people that it's not just a nice thing to have a republic, it might be, but it's an absolute necessity to have this workers' republic if we're to have a life that's worth living and it's worth offering to our country men and women. Well, of course. Um, the appropriate place for rights for minorities and protections, constitutional protections, whatever, uh, is obviously under the Irish Republic. Um, the democratic programme, by all means, that's the type of Ireland we should be aiming towards. Uh, just in terms of what Danny was saying there, um, I think when we, when we look at this whole process, it, it, it all comes back to uh, what, what, what is the outcome? What, what, are, what are the outcomes of the process? And, um, you know, we need, what we really need to be focusing on now is Republicans going forward, Republicans who advocate for the Irish Republic, uh, not a united Ireland of itself. Um, what we need to be doing now, I think, is setting out the concrete steps of how that situation will be arrived at. Um, for me, personally, the approach would be, if Britain leaves Ireland in the morning, you're still, you still have the free state standing. So 
it has to be a, a completely new beginning with all of that there put to the side. And I think the only way we can do that is by a, a 32 county referendum that has a, as a stated aim and intention the reconstitution of the Irish Republic. So that's the first step. From there, we hold an all Ireland election and uh, it's for the people of Ireland then obviously to send their representatives to sit in the all Ireland Doyle and that Doyle should, uh, should sit as a constituent assembly. Uh, and it is there in that entity where a new constitution, a bill of rights that uh, sets out the type of Ireland, the protections that we're going to have for the Irish people, that's where all that there, that's where all that is set out. And uh, once we've achieved that, um, that the outcome of that process should be put out to the people for a national referendum. And if they approve that, then we move on to the Irish Republic. But at that stage, we have restored the Republic. And that point forward, I suppose we would require some kind of a, a government of national unity to oversee the transition. But, but from there forward, it's a matter for the Irish people to elect the government that they wish to govern Ireland. Whatever that might be, we don't, have, we don't necessarily have to accept it, but we have to accept the democratic process of the Republic, work within that process to bring about the change further than the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which would have already been agreed. And I hope that addresses your point, Danny. Uh, that's the way I would see the thing, how we should take it forward. Thank you. Uh, just on Maliki's point in terms of the first, the first oil uh, and the document for that, even for his time it was a very pro progressive document and it was about including, being an, it was inclusive uh, and, uh, and embracing all, all people. And as Tommy says, there is you know, 1.1 million unions in Protestant community here. And I, I suspect, and my gut feeling tells me, in their heart of hearts, they do know this is moving towards the end game. And we've got a, even if those were to vote no and against uh, a referendum, regardless of this, we've got to secure them the same rights, uh, regardless of in terms of their, their beliefs, uh, their traditions, we've got to secure them for, for those people. Uh, because if they're doing that, and see the stuff we talked about in terms of the first oil and cherishing all our people, then it's not worth the thing, it's not worth the paper that uh, it's wrote on. And the terms, as I think yourself is sitting in here, Danny, is that you write this, this notion, and I don't feel comfortable at times that the demonization of all Republicans, we've been, we've been doing that now for the last 20 years. Is that the way we still want to go? Is that where we're going to go? Are we going to take a realistic thing and saying, look, there's a common thing, there's a common uh, goal here together. You know, let's, we might not agree everything uh, that's there, but if we can find a common, a common purpose, most people who walked into the GPO on Easter Sunday morning, not every one of them agreed on everything. And I'm sure there's variations of opinions, but the common thing was to break that link wing with England. That still exists, it's still here today. Do we want to go down the road to persecute each other? Absolutely not. I'm for about forward progression, about building alliances and creating that opportunity, seizing it. It's, it's like, are we going to wait for another 10 years this chance comes again, like some celestial comet. This is the here and the now. We have to grasp it. It's not a pipe dream, it's a reality. So you to get with the program, be part of it, not oppose it, not throw in obstacles. I think we covered the, the, the question at all. Right. And, I, and I would say the program the first all has been covered. Uh, Frankie, you want to Address your point about demonization and inter Republican rivalry in general. I, I, I'm not talking about genuine constructive criticism within the Republican base. That that's a good thing. That's a healthy thing. Uh, but we know, we all know, there's another level of, of, of criticism. And I like to, I like to compare it sometimes to. I'm talking, I'm talking about the more the nastier side, the nastier side of demonization of the, and the marginalization of Republican voices, the deliberate trolling of them. Um, I like to compare it sometimes to sexism, racism, homophobia. They are sometimes based on ignorance, based on unfounded fears, based on unfounded suspicion, and sometimes the state's just behind it, like all those other things. Um, but 
unlike racism, sexism, homophobia, etc. There's only the best place to break it down is through struggle. It's only when I I, I read about some Republican groups and I, and I hear about them and their individuals and if you had believed everything you read or heard, you'd think these people were just the word demons until you meet them in the course of a, a picket, a protest, day-to-day -day organization, and that's where the suspicion gets broke down. That's where the old animosities and uh, mistrusts and irrational fears get broke down in the court, just like in the just like in, on the picket lines uh, during the minor strike. When, when once racist people became realised the, the 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 value of solidarity, instead they realised the values of of of, of uh, throwing away sexism, throwing away homophobia, and, and embracing principles of solidarity instead. But we're talking about tonight the type of campaign that we're trying to promote tonight and get off the ground is the perfect um, uh, scenario. It's the perfect atmosphere in which we can break down some of what has frankly been a load of shit over the years in the Republican fighting, schisms, demonization. There's no better way to break it down than in the course of a people's struggle, because there'll be too much to be getting on with than to be bothered with unfounded, uh, unfounded allegations and suspicions. So it's the best way I can pass that. Thank you. Folks, I'm conscious that uh, we've been here for over two hours now, so I'll uh, I'll round it off with maybe um, another question from the front here, and um, I'll let the panel quickly respond. If you, if you keep her short and concise, and we'll wrap it up. So, I, it's just, just to get it clarified, um, it is going to be very short. From yourself, Kieran, and Brian, there, um, are, are you limiting yourselves to simply campaigning on this board of poll at the minute, or are you open to campaigning on like uh, our own, holding our own referendum, same way as um, they've done in Catalonia, and as Sean's maybe suggesting as well, whether it be holding their own assembly or whether it be you know and putting some kind of um, program whatever to the people, or as they in, in, in holding their own referendum, a 32 county referendum. Just uh, I, I wasn't sure if he's if he's I didn't, didn't get to hear if he's actually said one way or the other. Not. limiting ourselves to it? Definitely not. Um, but as, as Hammy says, you know, we deal with what, what's coming, and this is coming, and it looks like that's where we're going to be. But are we limited? If something else comes... Simul simultaneously, though, will there be any possibility of that? If, if it helps, I, I agree. I just agree with the greatest respect to societies. I agree with Tommy's point. I think it's a it's largely a moot point. It's, it's, it may quickly become academic, and if there's a board of gold, by all means, we can have it in all 32 counties uh, uh, if, it, if it helps. Well, it's a good, a good point, but uh, uh, we've heard Connie quote it several times, and Connie also said, by the border exists, we get nothing done. That's a reality. You know, what separates us? We sit and we and what separates the sectarianism separates And Britain's going to foment that sectarianism, and we don't want Britain from all the matters. So we need to remove the van, and it certainly agrees so with the order of the public, of course, that it. That's it, but without Ireland, we're getting the word. <coughs> Frank, not just the point is that I agree to you with Kieran saying is that it's about not limiting it, it's, it's reaching for the stars. But I'm trying to think to myself is that when we're talking and, and bringing that argument, we need to first warn the referendum for a border poll, secure that, and then it opens, it opens everything out there to shape on what kind of Ireland we have. And everybody under the sun at that stage, Republican and non Republican, will then help to shape that. And that may be the time. Then we back the pitch here for all Ireland uh, referendum. It's about getting, it's lining all the ducks up in a row. Would throwing the an all Ireland referendum and along with the referendum would it confuse things? Would it give people who are opposed to it 
an opportunity to try and unpack and, 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 and damage uh, the, 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 the referendum, ram, referendum canon. That's quite possible. It's like everything in the round, when these opportunities come, there will be counter opportunities. And if we have to look at it, then that's the best way to move forward. But is it possible that the huge things could collide and maybe damage the whole thing? I don't know. But that's open for debate. Um, just to pick up on what Frank said there, um, he says, and he's right, if you don't remove the British, you can get nothing done. The question for the people in this room, for the people in this panel, is can a border poll referendum remove the British from Ireland? Because the way I'm looking at it, I don't see how that's going to happen. Because it, it's, it's shaping up that these Brits are still going to be in our country. Forward this yes vote uh, is obviously under the Irish Republic. Um, the democratic program, by all means, that's the type of Ireland we should be aiming towards. Uh, just in terms of what Danny was saying there, um, I think when we, when we look at this whole process, it, it, it all comes back to uh, what, what, what is the outcome? What, what, are, what are the outcomes of the process? And, um, you know, we need, what we really need to be focusing on now is Republicans going forward. Republicans who advocate for the Irish Republic, uh, not a united Ireland of itself. Um, what we need to be doing now, I think, is setting out the concrete steps of how that situation will be arrived at. Um, for me, personally, the approach would be if Britain leaves Ireland in the morning, you're still, you still have the free state standing. So it has to be a, a completely new beginning with all of that there put to the side. And I think the only way we can do that is by a, a 32 county referendum that has a, as a stated aim and intention the reconstitution of the Irish Republic. So that's the first step. From there, we're holding all Ireland election and uh, it's for the people of Ireland then, obviously, to send their representatives to sit in the All Ireland Doyle, and that Doyle should uh, should sit as a constituent assembly, uh, and it is there in that entity where a new constitution, a bill of rights that uh, sets out the type of Ireland, the protections that we're going to have for the Irish people. That's where all that there, that's where all that is set out, and uh, once we've achieved that. Um, that the outcome of that process should be put out to the people for a national referendum. And if they approve that, then we move on to the Irish Republic. But at that stage, we have restored the Republic. And that point forward, I suppose we would require some kind of a, a government of national unity to oversee the transition. But, but from there forward, it's a matter for the Irish people to elect the government that they wish to govern Ireland. Whatever that might be, we don't, have, we don't necessarily have to accept it, but we have to accept the democratic process of the Republic, work within that process to bring about the change, further than the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which would have already been agreed. And I hope that addresses your point, Danny. Uh, that's the way I would see the thing, how we should take it forward. Thank you. Uh, just on Maliki's point in terms of the first, the first oil, uh, and the document for that, even for its time, it was a very pro progressive document, and it was about including being in, was inclusive uh, and, and embracing all, all people. And as Tommy says, there is you know 1.1 million unions Protestant community here, and I, I suspect, and my gut feeling tells me, in their heart of hearts, they do know this is moving towards the end game, and we've got a even if those were to vote no and against uh, a referendum, regardless of, we've got to secure them the same rights, uh, regardless of, in terms of their, their beliefs, uh, their traditions, we've got to secure them for, for those people. Uh, because if we're doing that, and see the stuff we talked about in terms of the first oil and cherishing all our people, then it's not worth a thing, it's not worth the paper that uh, it's wrote on. And the terms, is, I think yourself is something here, Danny, is it? Right, this this notion, and I don't feel comfortable at times that the demonization of Republicans. We've been, we've been doing that now for the last 20 years. Is that the way we still want to go? 
Is that where we're going to go? Or are we going to take a realistic thing and saying, look, there's a common thing, there's a common uh, goal here together. You know, let's, we might not agree everything uh, is there, but if we can find a common, a common purpose. Most people who walked into the GPO on Easter Sunday morning, not every one of them agreed on everything. And I'm sure there's variations of opinions, but the common thing was to break that link wing with England. That still exists, it's still here today. Do we want to go down the road of persecuting each other? Absolutely not. I'm for about forward progression, about building alliances and creating that opportunity, seizing it. It's, it's like, are we going to wait for another 10 years till this chance comes again, like some celestial comet? This is the here and the now. We have to grasp it. It's not a pipe dream, it's reality. So you ought to get with the program, be part of it, not oppose it, not throw in obstacles. I think it would be covered the, the, the question at all. But cover, and, I, and I would say that the program of the first all has been covered. Uh, Frankie, you want to address your point about demonization and inter Republican rivalry in general? I, I, I'm not talking about genuine constructive criticism within the Republican base. That That's a good thing. That's a healthy thing. Uh, but we know, we all know there's another level of, of, of criticism. And I like to, I like to compare it sometimes to, I'm, talk, I'm talking about the more, the nastier side, the nastier side of demonization of the, and the marginalization of Republican voices, the deliberate trolling of them. Um, I like to compare it sometimes to sexism, racism, homophobia. They are sometimes based on ignorance, based on unfounded fears, based on unfounded suspicion, and sometimes the state's just behind it, like all those other things. Um, but unlike racism, sexism, homophobia, etc., there's only the best place to break it down is through struggle. It's only when I I, I read about some Republican groups and I, and I hear about them and their individuals, and if you had believed everything you read or heard, you'd think these people were just the word demons until you meet them in the course of a picket, a protest, day-to-day -day organization, and that's where the suspicion gets broke down. That's where the old animosities and uh, mistrusts and irrational fears get broke down in the court, just like in the just like in, on the picket lines uh, during the minor strike, when, when once racist people became, realized the, 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 the value of solidarity instead, they realized the values of, of, of of uh, throwing away sexism, throwing away homophobia, and, and embracing principles of solidarity instead. But we're talking about tonight the type of campaign that we're trying to promote tonight and get off the ground is the perfect um, uh, scenario. It's the perfect atmosphere in which we can break down some of what has frankly been a load of shit over the years in the Republican fighting, schisms, demonization. There's no better way to break it down than in the course of a people's struggle because there'll be too much to be getting on with than to be bothered with unfounded, uh, unfounded allegations and suspicions. So it's the best way I can ask that, Frank. Folks, I'm conscious that uh, we've been here for over two hours now, so I'll, uh, I'll round it off with maybe um, another question from the front here, and um, they'll let the panel quickly respond, if you, if you keep it short and concise, and we'll wrap it up. Sorry, it's just just to get the clarity, um, it is going to be very short. From yourself, Kieran and Brian, there, um, are, are you limiting yourselves to simply campaigning on this board of poll at the minute, or are you as open to campaigning on like uh, our own holding our own referendum, same way as um, they've done in Catalonia and as Sean's maybe suggest as well, whether it be holding our own assembly or whether it be you know and putting some kind of um, program whatever to the people or as uh, in, in, in holding own referendum, a 32 county referendum. Just, uh, I, I wasn't sure if he's, if he's a threat, I didn't, didn't get to hear if he's actually said one way or the other on that.
Uh, are we limiting ourselves to definitely not? Um, but as, as Tommy says, you know, we deal with what what's coming, and this is coming, and it looks like that's where we're going to be. But are we limit? If something else comes Simul simultaneously, though, will there be any possibility? That if if it helps, I, I agree. I just agree with the greatest respect to society's. I agree with Tommy's point. I think it's a it's largely a moot point. It's it's it may quickly become academic, and if there's a board of gold, by all means, we can. Have it in all 30 counties uh, uh, if, it, if it helps. That's a good, a good point, but uh, and we'll put it Tommy quoted several times, and then Tommy also said, by the water exists, we get nothing done. That's a reality. Yeah. You know, and what separates us? We sit and we look and what separates us? Sectarianism separates us. And Britain's going to put a comment that sectarian and as long as Britain's involved in that. So we need to remove the van, and I certainly agree it should be a work of the public, of course, that it. That's it. But without Ireland, we're getting the work. <coughs> Frank, I'm not just the point is that I agree to you what you're saying is that it's about not limiting it, it's, it's reaching for the stars. But I'm trying to think of myself is that when we're talking and, and bringing that argument, we need to first warn the referendum for a border poll, secure that, and then it opens, it opens everything out there to shape on what kind of Ireland we have. And everybody under the sun at that stage, Republican and non Republican, will then help to shape that. And that may be the time. Then we make the pitch here for all Ireland uh, referendum. It's about getting, it's lining all the ducks up in the room. Would throwing the an all Ireland referendum in along with the referendum would it confuse things? Would it give people who are opposed to it an opportunity to try and unpick and and and, and damage uh, the, the the referendum referendum kind of? That's quite possible. It's like everything in the round. When these opportunities come, there will be counter opportunities. And if we have to look at it, then that's the best way to move forward. But is it possible that two things could collide and maybe damage the whole thing? I don't know. But that's open for debate. Um, just to pick up on what Frank said there, um, he says, and he's right, if you don't remove the British, you can get nothing done. The question for the people in this room, for the people in this panel, is can a border poll referendum remove the British from Ireland? Because the way I'm looking at it, I don't see how that's going to happen. Because it, it's, it's shaping up that these Brits are still going to be in our country. Forward this yes vote. Maybe in, it's obviously going to be in a reduced capacity with the Dublin government assuming the sovereign power status. But they're still going to be here. So if we're saying we can't get, if we're saying we need to get the British out of our country before we can do anything, well then, whatever project we put forward here, whether it's mounted on a border poll, an all iron referendum, whatever, the most important part is not the mechanism. The important part is the outcome that your mechanism sets toward. Now, unless we have that listed, unless we have that on our program, unless we're saying, if we're calling for a border poll that removes Britain from Ireland and establishes the sovereign democratic republic, then that border poll is worth nothing as far as I'm concerned. And that has to be considered by all people that's on this train or whatever we want to call it. Thank you. I think it goes to the question that we've got to break the connection with Britain. We've got to do that. It's, I mean, that's, we've been do, trying to do that for over two centuries. It's, it goes to the contradiction that we've got to break the connection. How we go about it, uh, we may not be given the opportunity to pick the the ground. We may be presented with a border poll, so we've got to be w prepared or waiting for that. The main thing to keep in mind is that we've got to break the connection with Britain, but we've got to also keep in mind that we're talking about establishing a sovereign people in, in, a, in a sovereign republic. And a word of caution is that if we do not identify where we're going, if we leave it in that sort of ambivalent way that we're talking simply of a united Ireland, we could find ourselves back to where we were in 22, where we end up with this damn good bargain and is and told that we have the stepping stones to the Republic. Unless we're determined to go to a Republic, we can miss the chance 
and we could miss it for a long, long time. So I think that's what we have to keep in mind. It's not an either or. It's not. A, it's, it's. It's not that we have to drop one against the other. <coughs> we've got to get rid of the British. We've got to break the connection. We've got to re-establish the sovereignty of the people, and make sure that we're not sold a pop in the process. All right, folks. Uh, oh, 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 one more quick one. Yeah, we can probably fill it up. Um, I am from the LGBT community um, and when we fought for that down south, it wasn't just by, with the people uh, at the top, it was at the bottom and we worked ourselves up and we got everybody to talk to everybody, their family, their friends, the people that, we, that were against us and to try and reason and let them listen to us. So. With that said, I, I my partner uh, was from a unionist background. Uh, she's from Ballymena, one of the worst areas that I could possibly walk into. But yet I go and I walk up there and I talk to her, I talk to her family, and I got her to vote. And that's the way we have to try and do it. Not just the powers that be, it's all of us, it's all a collective, and I think that's one of the things that we try to bring with uh, Save the Spurns as well, is you just have to work together and you have to go and talk to the people that don't know or don't realise what they're doing whenever they're voting for unionism, because they don't maybe realise what they're actually voting for. Well done. Right folks, on that positive note, I think that's the, the correct one to wrap it up on uh, this evening. Um, just to make everybody aware again that this is not the end of the simulated border poll unity referendum in the Straban Lifford area. Beginning on Saturday and uh, in uh, assembling in Drumrally Estate at the area volunteer Eugene Devlin Memorial at 1pm, uh, there'll be a door-to-door -door canvas um, in which uh, people can participate by asking questions from our preset questionnaire on the doorsteps to give people an experience of, of being involved in a referendum campaign, uh, to train people up on the issues, to discover the fears that working class communities have uh, about the ending of partition, about building socialism and, 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 and asking them questions. On the Thursday evening canvases, um, we will be um, delivering through the doors in a, in a more in-depth, anonymous questionnaire that uh, people can um, discuss um, their fears about the health care system, the education system, infrastructure, uh, social issues, cultural issues. And, and for me personally, that's probably the most important part of the simulated border poll unity referendum because it's the part that will give Republicans and socialists a real understanding and one to one to the fears that's out there about um, a united Ireland and the end of the partition. We are going to share um, all that information with all Republican groups. Whoever wants it um, can 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 have it. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll be drawing up a document on it uh, after this. Uh, as I said before, this is not the end. Uh, we're for Derry City for a simulated border poll unity referendum. In February, we'll hopefully have a, have a similar panel uh, debate um, to kick it off. So uh, I would like to thank every single person for coming this evening. Oh, 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 oh there's Kieran. <laughs> Sorry for intervening, folks. The, the reason I'm intervening is we, we've, we've been doing this in Belfast. Um, I want to talk about the, the worthiness of it. I'm sure I've been done it five years ago. But, um, we've been doing it in the past few months in Belfast, and it, it, I, I would really propose send in any any activists on this for, for two reasons. If you have an activist who isn't confident on the doorstep, which most of which I wasn't for this process at all, at, at the end of it, you, he will be. He will know how to... Uh, he, sorry, Burra, Tommy Burra, if you he or she, um, he or she will, will be... Uh, gender imbalance, we, we need more she's in Belfast, feel free to refer them to us. Um, the, he or she will be confident at the end of that process when they knock on the door and ask Questions that very very often the pe the people in, in, in those homes haven't thought about the issue. So not, not only are you asking questions, 
very much explaining the issues. And by the time you're, you're finished, that, that person will be you'll be f fit to export them uh, elsewhere. The, another great thing about this is we we've done this successfully in in Davis, unsurprisingly, uh, New Barnsley and in Lenadoon, extensive area enough areas of Belfast. Um, now, when the time comes, we can now. We have now a mandate to go into community groups, sporting groups and all in, the, in this area and say, listen, you just need to be on this march with us. Because 83%, for example, of people in New Barnsley who have responded, have responded positively. You knew how, now have a duty. You know, it's, it, it takes it one, straight away, what I said earlier, it takes it out of the hands of the usual suspects that people have at this table and it throws it down. And that's when we start seeing change. I high, highly endorse uh, taking part in what, what the comrades in Stavane are doing this Saturday. All right, Kieran, thanks very much, folks, and thanks very much, everybody, for coming. Um, I think it's fair to say that it was a decent enough success, and uh, we'll be seeing you on Saturday. Thank you.